figure that out. It's going to be a short teaching. Many people, they believe in Yeshua as Messiah, but many people don't know what Yeshua came to do. When you talk to Jewish people that know Torah, and you begin to tell them about Yeshua the way we learned it in the church, on some things you will be hard-pressed to find some answers. Because we do not study the temple, we do not study the sacrifices, yet we talk about Yeshua being one. Right? Or being a type of an offering. But then when I began to research, I've been studying the book of Hebrews now intensively since 2006. About seven years ago, six years ago, one of my students, he said, Hey Rico, did you know that the word there in Hebrews 9, verse 22, 9.22, I'm going to read it to you. Hebrews 9.22 says, Indeed, nearly everything is purified with blood according to the law. And apart from the shedding of the blood, there is no forgiveness. Now, if I'm a betting man, which I'm not, I'll guarantee you that in some of your Bibles, it does not say forgiveness of sin or forgiveness. Raise your hand if your Bible says remission. Raise your hand if it says forgiveness. Raise your hand if it says forgiveness of sins. There are different words. The one that is using here is a very important word. We've been talking, and this is a perfect setting. I was thinking this morning, what am I going to teach about? Because this, I've taught so many years, and I try to do something different uh, every time I come. And this year, I was thinking about this particular word. And I'm thinking, Yeshua's ministry came to give us freedom, to give us a jubilee. The question is, from what? Many people say, from the law. But is that really what the Torah says? The book of Hebrews was written in the context of the Day of Atonement, but it also has a language that I never knew until seven years ago. By the way, I'm going to do my thesis for my doctorate exactly on this topic. That's really what I'm working on. Okay? So what happens is that we are in the Sea of Galilee, which in fact is just a lake. We already talked on Monday what the sea represented in the ancient world. It represented chaos, the underworld, the gateway to the underworld. And the religions was all about the underworld gods, the gods of death. We saw that in Caesarea Philippi, remember? The whole Peter Pan thing, the whole God Pan, half man, half goat. And they used to put an offering to that God in the little, they would drop it down the uh, the rocks. And if you saw the blood return, then the gods did not accept it. But if you didn't see the blood return, then the gods accepted the offering. That's what they believed. And then we see all the stories of the Bible, which I talked about on Monday. I'm not going to repeat them, but a very interesting event occurred here. And when Yeshua started his ministry in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, he told us exactly what he was going to do. He was going to bring freedom, liberty. He quoted Isaiah 61, verse 1 and verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he has a t and the Lord has anointed me to teach, to give you the good, the good tidings, the good news. What is the good news, though? We talked about it today in Beshan. The good news of the Roman Empire was what? To give you roads, to give you water, to give you bathrooms, to give you uh, stadiums, to give you entertainment. What is the good news of God that he sent to his son Yeshua to give us? We need to ask that question. We preach the good news. But yet, when you read the book of Galatians, it says that the good news was also preached to Abraham. That kind of throws everybody for a loop. Because they told me the good news is only for the New Testament, you see? But yet it says that Abraham also was preached the good news. He received freedom. He received righteousness. The righteousness of God came upon him because he was moral and he was righteous. So therefore, Yeshua told us from the get-go, every miracle, every miracle, on the other side of those mountains, you're going to have, you're going to have the Decapolis, pagan cities, and people wanted to flock to those places like Bek Shean. In the north, you're going to see Kipa, uh, Capernaum. Okay, you're going to see Bethsaida a little bit far to the north. You're going to see Colzin over here. Okay, so you're going to have all of the cities in which the ministry of Yeshua was. Uh, he impacted those communities by the miracles he performed. But yet we never understand why he performed those miracles. What is the message behind the Beatitudes? What is the message behind the ten low, uh, the ten? Uh, um, the, yeah, the, ten, the five loaves and the two fish. What is the message behind all this? Why did he heal the leper? Why did he walk on water? Why did he do all these things? I mean, we need to ask the question. What is the one thing really that he come to do? 
Can somebody go to Isaiah chapter 28? Chapter 25, verse 8, please. Quickly. I need your help. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8. Can you please read it out loud, really loud, when you have it? Go ahead. So he has, thank you. So he has swallowed, he will swallow up death forever. That is the ultimate prophecy quoted three times in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 15, and then in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. That's the essence of the gospel. It's not against Torah you sure are speaking against. He's speaking against moral behavior that would lead to sin. And by removing the penalty of sin through the resurrection, now we have access to eternal life and God's sacred space, which is the garden. Are you with me? So Yeshua's ministry was based on how can he restore the righteousness of God as a righteous king to a people who has rebelled against him. That's really the gospel. How did God restore his kingdom? Right now in Israel, we're stand, we're, we're stand, I'm standing on a boat in the middle of the, uh, of the Sea of Galilee. So many events happen here. Many people come here, and I'm sure you can talk to Danny, the owner of the boat. There are thousands of people he has seen the last 25 years. But my question is, do they really understand why Yeshua walked on those waters? And what's the message behind that miracle that he did? Because in reality, he didn't need to do that in order for him to prove that he's the Messiah, or did he? Because Jonah told the people, throw me in the water and the storm will cease. Noah was told to build a ship and to get on the ship, and he was saved. So clearly this has a huge significance about what God is about to do. You know, walking on water, which today is calm, there's peace, there's order, there's no storm. In the, in the northern kingdom, they used to worship Baal and Ashtarte, Asherah. The fertility rit rituals that they used to do it was an abomination before the Lord. And there now, the, the Messiah is trying to bring a message of reconciliation against the people who turn against them, the ten tribes. They went into the dispersion, and now Messiah came to this place, and he says, I'm going to tell you the purpose why I came. I came to feed the homeless and the widows and the strangers. Because the God of Israel who sent me, he's not going to leave his people ever without any food. He's not an oppressor. I will heal the sick. Why? Because the God of Israel wants to make sure that he's a patron who takes care of his children when they're sick. I'm going to take care of those people marginalized, the widows, and the people who are not treated with uh, equity and with, uh, with righteousness. And he made everyone feel to the point that he went to a leper in which everyone will see because they were unclean. Tame, 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 unclean, unclean. But Yeshua does something very important. Yeshua goes to the person and it says, you're clean. But then he does something. He touches him. No one has touched that guy in years. Have you ever asked the question? Who was the last person he got a hug from? In other words, Yeshua was willing to be ritually contaminated in order, to, in order not only to heal that person afflicted with leprosy, which is basically dead men walking, but also to raise his heart, his level of honor, that the son of the living God was, took the time to talk to him, and then touch him. Make him feel like a human being again. That's what God is trying to do with you. That's why the trip is designed to make you feel like you do matter. Regardless of your circumstances. Regardless of your testing periods. Regardless of any mistake you've made. Here you are. The Lord has brought you to the place where he walked. To show that through him, God will defeat death forever. Amen. He will give you a freedom that religion cannot give you. When he says, if you're free, you're truly free indeed. Mm -hmm. Free from what? Can you go to Revelation chapter <coughs> 1, verse 5, please? Now, what's interesting, as she, my sister, gets that word, I'm going to give you the definition of what the word there, forgiveness or remission is in the book of Hebrews. And again, I don't have time to really cover this. I don't want to take time too long to do a teaching. I want you to rejoice, but I want to do a teaching that makes you reflect as to why you will raise your hands and you will raise your voices and you will delight and you will sing to the Lord today for the happiness that you feel for being delivered from the one thing religion cannot give you, money cannot give you, nothing can give you the solution for eternal death. 
nothing and no one. That was, a, that was actually the whole premise of every ancient religion, trying to, uh, to solve the riddle of life. Who controls eternal life? The book of the dead in Egypt, the, uh, the creation motif in, uh, in Mesopotamia, you know, all the Canaanite motifs. And here the Bible is telling us who has dominion over death. And still Israel didn't get it. And they still worship the gods of the underworld. And finally God says, I will send my son. And everything he does is going to reflect my character, my integrity. And he will show you what the ultimate plan of God is. Because Israel did not do what they were supposed to. Sacred space. So who's got that verse? Revelation 1.5. Go ahead and read it, brother. Sister. To whom our sins by his blood... Who has made us into a kingdom, priest for his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Uh, that's verse five. Okay, I did it wrong. No, you did fine. Just keep going. Uh, more? Uh, that's that's verse five or six. I just did five. Okay. You missed something there. No, she read six. Okay, read five. Okay. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Keep going. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead and read it. Okay. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own name. It doesn't say that in the Greek. Washed. Free? Freed. 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 Google says freed. Yeah, Google's right. What does yours say? What, from freed to wash. If you look at that word, any place else in the whole New Testament is freed, not washed. It's a one letter difference in the Greek. Freed us from what? That's the question. From regular sin? Well, we can all regularly sin and transgress, and we're not going to go to hell for that. You know? But what if he freed us from the one thing that no one can free us from? Death. Eternal damnation, which is the mystery that everyone is trying to solve. People went to extremes trying to get 20,000 shots so they don't die. From a virus, right, that does take life away. We all, have, we all suffer from a virus. It's called death. And the vaccine is Yeshua. He is, the, he is the vaccine that God selected to become the mediator between humanity and God to say, through him, the resurrection is the proof that the God of Israel is the one and only true God who has dominion over death. Whoever had dominion over the underworld was considered the king of the universe. Remember that. So what happened here, walking in the sea that is so beautiful and so calm on the night that after he fed the people, and there's a storm, and then he comes over here. He's walking in the middle of a storm. Interesting. The storm god, Baal, has no power over Yeshua because God sent him in order to show the disciples that the God of Israel sent his son, his imprint, his image, everything God is through him so everyone would understand that the enemy has no, no weapons against us. I don't know if that excites you, but it makes me happy. To know that we are in the place where all these events took place. But many people don't even know why they had to happen. Peter. As long as he kept his eyes fixed on Yeshua, he was able to walk on water. In other words, if you keep your eyes on the right hand of the Lord, then you'll be able to defeat death. That's the whole purpose. It's not about whether or not he had the power to really walk on water. Go ahead, try it. See how that works for you. The only reason it worked when Yeshua was here is because Yeshua believed he could do it once he kept his eyes on the Messiah that God sent. The moment he looked around to the storm, he went in. And what did Peter do? He cried out, save me. And it says, immediately he was taken out from the waters, drowning death into life. The message of the gospel and the plan of God right in that miracle but people focus on the miracle and they don't they do not they do not understand the miracle. And that's what I'm trying to make you understand. This whole two weeks, there's more to the story. A lot more. Now that word Ephesus, uh, Ephesus. Okay? Ephesus, I'm sorry. Is a word that means forgiveness or pardon. 
It's like when they when the king pardons somebody who was supposed to go for death. I had a doctor in um, I had a doctor in Costa Rica after I did the teaching. It took me three hours to do the teaching. After I did the teaching, the doctor comes up to me and goes, Did you know that when I was in medical school, they taught us that when there is a, for example, someone who had cancer and is in remission. Get it? It's actually a, 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 a medical term. The word aphesis in the Greek is actually included into the medical terms when there's a sickness that there's no cure for and then you were cured. Oh, no, I, you missed that one. Okay, let me work. Let me go from the beginning. You know, we are in the Sea of Galilee. So that word remission is very important. Now, I, I want you to give, I want to give you homework. Your homework is, and I'll give you the verses. If you want them, I'll give you the verses. To go through every verse where you find that word in the New Testament. 14 places. And instead, and by the way, when you look at the definition of emphasis, it's found 50 times in the, in the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek to the Hebrew Bible. Now, when you trace that word aphesis in the New Testament to aphesis in the Torah and the prophets, but in the Septuagint in the Greek, and you put it back into the Hebrew, you know what the word is? Jubilee. Jubilee. What happens in the Jubilee? You restore your land. You restore back to your original state, right? Proclaim liberty. See, Judas Iscariot turned against Yeshua because he thought that Yeshua was going to give him offices from the Romans. It's going to give him a. It's going to release him from the oppression of the Romans, and they missed the picture that Yeshua came so that God would give him remission from eternal damnation. It's a long-term process. Is now the short term. Is this making sense? Yes. So when you look at this word, and then you look into the out of the fifty after the, out of the fifty times, twenty five times is connected with the jubilee, jovel or shemitah, the whole releasing of slaves. We have been slave to sin all this time. That leads us into death. God has given you a great gift, which is what salvation, right? But what is the confession of faith? If you confess that Yeshua is your master, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall, you shall be saved. Let me ask you a question. Why do you need to believe that God raised Yeshua from the dead to receive the gift of salvation? It's conditional. He'll give you the gift if you believe that he resurrected him. Because the moment you believe that God is the only one who has the power to remove you from the chaos, remove you from the underworld, remove you from the whole uh, uh, sovereignty of the enemy, that he's the only one who has the power to do so, now you give him the only attribute of power that no one else had and they were looking for. Now imagine if you were an Israelite in the first century and the Romans and they believed that it was Caesar who had control over death and life, life and death. And then they, they crucified Yeshua, and that was the most devastating, most despicable type of death you can have in the first century. It will shame you, it will shame your family, it will shame your whole nation. And then Yeshua was crucified on the third day he resurrects. What would that mean to a Roman and a Greek and an Israelite, oppressed by, the, by Rome and the, and the emperor? That the emperor had no dominion over your life. This is the reason why the gospel exploded in the first century. People that were slaves in the Roman Empire received the gospel, the good news, that God will give you freedom they cannot obtain in this world. And then Paul says, don't worry, you'll be transformed in a twinkling of an eye. Just have faith. Keep working, produce fruit, because he already defeated death. The whole thing that happened here is to send a picture that people would have understood in the ancient world. God sent his son so that we will finally get the memo that the God of Israel has control over the underworld, over all creation. And you have been partakers of that. You have been invited to be part of that kingdom, to proclaim and to let everybody know that no one else has eternal life, but only the God of Israel through his son, Yeshua. So as we worship today, 
as we praise the Lord today, as we dance, dance for him in gratitude to let him know thank you for hosting us in your land. Thank you for inviting us to your land. Thank you for teaching us in your land. Thank you, thank you for allowing us to spy out your land, for the land is good. Thank you, O oh Lord, for allow, allowing us to test the fruit of your land. Now we want to just rejoice in the Sea of Galilee, just like Yeshua at one point calmed the storm. Today we don't have to worry about a storm. We don't have to worry about death. We don't have to worry about eternal damnation. We now have peace. Shalom. And it's calm, and the storm no longer of death has any authority in our lives, because we are free. We are truly free, because the God of Israel gave us all remission from something that no one can do that. If that's not enough to be rejoicing today, I don't know what I don't know what else we can do. And that's why I'm so passionate about this. Because I finally get it. I want you to get it too. So when you go back home, you tell people you don't need to be afraid to go to the land. You will be hosted, you will be taken care of, you will dance for, and you will learn about how awesome and great he is. May the Lord bless you and keep you and thank you for your time. Amen.